I'm here today with Professor of Economics Radu Francianu, who is going to unveil for us the secrets of experimental economics. Thank you, Radu, for Thank joining me. Thank you, Maria, me. for inviting me. So I wanted to start by asking you the following question. What is the difference between economics and experimental economics? In economics, we study the allocation of resources among alternative uses of scarce resources. Uh, since we live in decentralized economy, most of the allocation is done through markets. So economics is studying markets. And when we say markets, we say prices. So probably this is the most important topic of research in economics, the determination of prices. Uh, at the heart of economic analysis, we need to have a model of decision making, how men, how humans decide the economic model of man. More precisely, how humans make decision. In a, the broad field of economics, so we have an analysis of facts, we have the theories based on some kind of axiomatic of the decision model, and we have the empirics, how we test these theories, how we confront the theories to the facts through empirical models. So this is economics in a nutshell, very briefly. Experimental economics is a new methodology that appeared in the field for in the last, so the first studies appeared in the 70s, but probably it's 30 years ago that it started to have a large momentum in economics to use experimental methods for the analysis of economic issues. That method is very much inspired from psychology, even biology. So it's a different way to do empirical analysis, to test our theories, different from the traditional empirical model, which are based on big data sets and uh, in general on time series. And how does it work? This method, as I told you, inspired by psychology, inspired by biology, takes subjects of a relatively heterogeneous type and brings them to the lab, as you can see uh, here. Be behind us. So in the lab, we try to submit these subjects to this economic decision. And we observe how these people in the control environment of the lab will take the economic decision. So when we say economic decision, we want to uh, make them feel that their performance, uh, the, the reward is related to their performance. So at the end, what will happen in many cases will pay them proportional to the pr performance. So this will replicate to some extent the market environment where this individual have to take the decision. And why theory and traditional data analysis are not enough and do lab data create added value? It's very interesting what's happening when you have a new methodology. Things are shaken a little bit in the field. So you come up with new ideas that you want to test. And the old idea are challenged by the new results. So what that happened when experimental economics appear first as a marginal, as a niche field, then a broader field, and now like a field on its own in economics, which journal, Nobel Prizes, association. So when the field established itself, it brings to economics a, a vision that enriched the standard model of men, the economic decision model that I argued at the beginning. T in traditional economics, we say people want to pursue their uh, own uh, interest, they have their goals, whatever their goals there are, they are rational in the sense they will do whatever they can to achieve their goals. This is a broad perspective, but in practice of economics, for many times, we consider that people were self-regarding. I care only about me, I, and myself. Uh, that they were somehow selfish. I want to maximize my own gain. So when experimental economics arrived, people say, wow, it could be very different. Maybe we all know that people are not like this, that we have much broader goals, that are much more a richer domain of decision. And experimental economics allow us to push the frontier of uh, traditional economics one step further. Some critics say, oh, it will change everything. No, it did not change everything. It did not 
destroyed economic, but to the contrary, make the field of economic even richer. So let me give you a very simple example about traditional economics and economics, modern economics based on experiments. So assume that you are, you are young <laughs> and you are indeed, you are a student, you come to the lab and in the lab I give you 20 euros when you arrive. And I ask you to share the 20 euros with an anonymous player, another person that you do not know. You see the isolation where you take the decision. He will leave the room and he will not know or she will not know uh, whether you give, who give him or her some money or if they give him some money at all. What would you do? Well, I've tried the experiment and I gave my money because I wanted, because I think the experiment was about when you give, uh, I don't know, five euros and if other people participate and they give uh, five euros as well, I make some substantial gain, something like that. So I wanted to give more. This I is a different game. Uh, this this but is a yeah, different but I gave my money. You give your <laughs> money. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a public good experiment <laughs> as you describe it. But even in the most, in the simplest, not to say the simplistic game, which is a dictator game, you just get the money and you need to give to someone else. Well, economic standard, old-fashioned economy say we should give nothing. Why should I give money to someone that I don't know and he does not know that I give you him some money? And in reality, this is not the case. Why? Because people have social preferences. They care about the other even if they don't know them. We have feelings of justice. Uh, we want to reciprocate. We have emotions. So it's obvious. I would say these are trivial things. Economists took too much time to discover this. It's not a problem of too less time, too much time. It's a problem. The former model bring us enormous insight in the economic in, into the analysis of society. There is no other discipline in the world who can explain neatly prices. So the old theory of economic explained prices did the job very well. Now, if we want to go beyond these uh, elements, try to understand more about human decision making, about bubbles, about panic, about financial crisis, we should take into account more and more these behavioral biases, these, uh, these emotions. So that's what uh, experimental economics help us to, to do. And are there any limitations and how are we to take them into account? Of course, there are limitations and uh, the most important thing is to be aware of this limitation. So first of all, uh, there is a big problem of replicability. So if you see in an experiment, if uh, Maria shares 20 euros, this does not mean that all the people in the world will share 20 euros. So what you need to do is to test it hundreds of times, several of thousands of times with different subjects, in different quarters, in different environments. And if the result is observed over a large uh, area of replication studies, then you start to have to trust in it. Never fully trust because we are in social sciences, always keep some doubt. But if thousands of people from poor country, from rich country, from small stakes, large stake, all will share 20% of their income, that means that there is something there where to, to think of it. So replicability is a big issue and we should continue to do it. Probably we don't do enough. Then there is a matter of framing. So everybody from experimental economics now is saying, ah, women are more averse to risk than men. Why? Because in many experiments, they see that in lab experiments, in choices of lottery, women prefer a less risky lottery and men prefer riskier lotteries. Okay, great. So this is a result. It's established by thousands of replication. But if you change the frame, and you look to the behavior of women trader and men trader taking financial decision, you don't see the same bias. So again, people must be very smart and to understand what should be understood and also to uh, be aware of the importance of the frame. And there are many other biases that we who do research in experimental economics are very concerned of them. W me personally, I'm very much concerned about the experimental demand effect. When you came with people into the lab, these people want to be nice with the organizer of the experiment. So we'll try to second guess what you expect from them. 
So do you share the 20 euros because you want to share the 20 euros? Or do you share the 20 euros because you see uh, is however the observer, the administrator, and the social norm is to share some money? So on this bias, I think we should be very, very, very careful about it. But once again, Experimental economics is not here to challenge economics. It's not here to change the traditional empirical method of economics. Econometrics, cross-section, country data, firm level data, time series, these are, have the tremendous value. We are here to call attention on some biases, on some uh, specificity, some, some richness of human behavior that sometimes were omitted by the traditional uh, analysis. But not at all. We are not here to, rev to come with the revolution of the field and even to say the, to discard the other methods. It's a complement to existing methods. Uh, can you maybe give me a recent example of, a, of an experiment you conducted here at the SEC or and what were your findings or maybe just um, of an experiment that you conducted? Yes, uh, the experimental lab of SEC, not in this form, but uh, first more rudimentary and now this, uh, this standard facility were created uh, in 2010. Uh, and since many colleagues in all the department, marketing, management, operation research, uh, developed, implemented very interesting studies. In economics, personally, I ran within the lab uh, about, uh, about 20 studies in 2010. Uh, and uh, uh, as an example, recently uh, with Delphine Dubar, who is uh, the administrator of the lab and a research engi engineer here, uh, we, uh, we ran an experiment on lying, uh, cheating uh, and deception. Uh, we try, based on a traditional experiment published in American Economic Review by Yuri Gnizi in 2005. So Yuri create an interesting communication game where a group of people can lie. We took the, uh, this type of experiment at the individual level. And we are me and another person, <laughs> anonymous, we don't know each other, send the receiver. So I have the choice between telling you the truth, send a true message, and a false message, a lie. The truth brings me some money, brings you some money, but the lie brings me more money and you get a loss. So it's typical a selfish lie that you can, unfortunately, very often in the business world, it can happen. People who negotiate will sometimes get into this lying uh, attitude. Uh, what we did, contrary a difference with the standard uh, study, we, here we try to in determine whether there is a price for you to be dishonest. How much do you ask in order to change from honest attitude, it's normal human being are honest, but if you pay, I have pay you enough, would you forgo, forgo honesty and become dishonest? So in the lab with uh, 100 subjects, yeah, we see that indeed 70% of them will have this threshold attitude where they are honest, but if you pay them enough, they will change that attitude and become dishonest. Uh, but also, interestingly, some people will be honest all the time. So honesty may be for them a, a guide, a lexicographic criteria, whatever is the amount of money, I'm honest. So some people react to incentive, some people are all the time uh, moral. And also, puzzling or not, some people are spiteful, not too many, luckily, but some people will lie even if they get nothing. So only it's a pleasure for some to uh, to make the other lose some money. Uh, yeah, that's human nature. So we learn things from, from this experiment. And for sure, there are managerial uh, implication because in uh, the world of company, in the world of negotiation, we can expect uh, such kind of behavior. And there are many experiments I would talk for hours for. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And why was it important for our, our school, for a sick business school, to have its own lab? I think that the idea of the lab is a typical example of uh, what we call at ESSEC uh, the pioneering spirit. So we like innovation, we like uh, new challenges. So when we created uh, it uh, 10 years ago, 
it was uh, by a group of professors, my colleagues in marketing were very strongly uh, advocate of the experiment, uh, the director uh, of the school at the time, and then uh, the second director, uh, all the administration supported us very much. But it's typical how we innovate, how we help uh, our researcher to get of the new tools to address new issues and uh, be original, come up with uh, impactful research, uh, deal with the uh, topics that are relevant for businesses and for society. So it's a typical an example of academic innovation uh, with application to research, which uh, personally I am proud to belong to an institution that uh, supports uh, this kind of uh, development, spontaneous development. Thank you, Ardu. I think this is all the time we have for now. Thank, Thank you, you, Maria. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Thank you very much. Me. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you.